In hundreds of crashes since the early days of flying, a pilot's enemy has been aircraft icing. You learned about aircraft icing back when you got your private license. It's part of your recurrent training. But we're going to review the subject just once more and help you continue to make informed cockpit decisions. Wings lose efficiency when they're contaminated. That means ice, snow, frost, slush, freezing rain, sleet, anything on the outside of the aircraft that should not be there. A few millimeters of ice will increase your stall speed up to 20%. More contamination will increase your stall speed even further. In flight situations, that also means all your stall warning systems, like the horn, can't warn you about an impending stall. Stall warning systems are calibrated to work as an effective warning under clean wing conditions only. There is no such thing as a little ice. Ice is dangerous in any quantity on any part of your aircraft. This ice is about an inch thick. On takeoff, you'll find reduced control or jammed controls. It will also probably happen just as you rotate on a slush-covered runway in bad weather. That's why we promote the clean aircraft concept as the only way to fly. The clean aircraft concept means no contamination adhering to the wings or vital control surfaces of your aircraft, no matter what the weather. The same concept applies to helicopters too. When you consider the critical components that are exposed to contamination, you see why everyone who flies a rotary wing must be aware of the dangers of even just a little ice. There are 13 major factors that contribute to contamination. Ambient temperature. This gives you a good indication about the potential for icing conditions. Aircraft surface temperature. Is a more reliable indication of your susceptibility to icing, especially when you have a short turnaround time at a station. Precipitation type and rate. Dry snow tends not to stick to the aircraft as much as wet snow, while freezing rain combined with any snow gives you slush. How heavy is the rate? Is this a full-fledged blizzard or just a steady snowfall? Relative humidity. Combined with air temperature and surface temperature, you can have icing conditions even though it's a clear day. Solar radiation. Is it a bright, sunny winter day or is it 100% overcast? Your aircraft will have a warmer surface temperature on some clear, sunny days and a lower surface temperature in shade. Wind velocity and direction. In Canada, north winds are usually cold and dry, while southerly winds are usually warmer and moist. Aside from being a factor in your takeoff distance calculations, winds can blow contamination onto or off your aircraft. Operation in close proximity of other aircraft or structures. The terminal building usually acts as a windbreak, but that causes wind eddies on the leeward side. That increases the apparent amount of snow that is falling. Exhaust or prop wash from other aircraft can often blow snow, ice, or slush back onto your aircraft, or cause snow on your aircraft to melt and refreeze as ice. Operation in snow, slush, or wet surfaces. Since most aircraft don't have fenders, you'll be kicking up slush or water from the landing gear on the apron, taxiways, and runway. Taxing with flaps down increases the likelihood you'll splash contamination on the flaps. Will it stick to the aircraft? It depends on the air temperature, surface temperature, relative humidity, and more. Aircraft component inclination angle, contour, and surface roughness. Every aircraft is different, but generally aircraft collect snow, freezing rain, and slush in all kinds of nooks and crannies. Smoother designs don't collect as much contamination, but they're just as treacherous because the smooth surface looks wet rather than icy. Presence of de-icing, anti-icing fluid. Some de-icing, anti-icing fluids provide a measure of holdover, depending on temperatures, precipitation, roughness, humidity, solar radiation, and wind direction, while other fluids offer no holdover at all. Strength of de-icing fluid. Again, there are more variables. Some airlines or contractors buy pre-mixed solutions. Others mix right at the nozzle. Some use 50-50 ethylene glycol in water. Others use 60-40. 
Others use a mixture of ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, corrosion inhibitors, and water at various temperatures and percentages. Fluid application procedures. Again, more variables based on all of the previous variables plus the specific requirements of your operations manual and the aircraft manufacturer. Some of the variables are obvious. If it's cold and snowing, you have contamination conditions, but others are not so obvious. The air temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. The aircraft skin is 4 degrees Celsius. This aircraft just arrived. The ambient air temperature en route from Toronto at 10,000 feet is minus 10 degrees. The fuel in the wing is still at minus 10 and is cold soaking the airframe. On a cool day, this wing will turn precipitation or even just humid air into ice or frost. The clean aircraft concept starts here. If the conditions that promote icing are present, you have to be alert before you get to the apron. When in doubt, ask. Ask the weather office for the most up-to-date forecast they have. Find out what kind of temperatures and precipitation you'll experience on your route and on the apron at all your stops. Check your manuals for the manufacturer's recommendations and your ops manual for the standards your airline has. Consult with the rest of your team. With smaller aircraft, you're at an advantage over the big carriers. During your walk around or pre-flight inspection, you can examine almost all of the aircraft yourself. Your eyes and hands are the best test instruments available. When in doubt, feel. Under certain conditions, an icy wing will look like a wet wing. If you fly high wing aircraft, it's a lot harder to check the top of the wings and fuselage, but make the effort. Or if the facilities are available, your apron people will assist. Remember, ground crews are part of the team too. When in doubt, ask for their observations. Depending on where you are, you could have a full de-icing crew with the most modern equipment available, or you could be on 3,000 feet of turf in the middle of nowhere. You need to know how to look after your aircraft. During winter, if you're overnighting, wing covers will save you time de-icing. If you've got them, use them. A stiff broom will remove light snow from the aircraft but you have to be careful around pitot tubes, static ports, and antenna arrays. In some cases, a rope thrown over the top of the wing or fuselage and sawed back and forth will remove frost. Where possible, let the wind and the shape of the aircraft work for you. you start from the top and work down, but consult your ops manual for the recommended procedure. When in doubt, repeat the de-icing procedure. At some airports, you also have to be your own de-icer. De-icing fluid is poisonous, and you should take precautions to keep from breathing in the spray, getting it on your skin, or getting it in your eyes. Generally, you use de-icing fluid mixed with hot water to melt and flush off contamination. As a guideline, start at the top and work down, but work symmetrically. Both sides, port and starboard, must be de-iced equally. De-icing just one side is asking for an unpredictable aircraft. Be careful not to spray de-icing fluid into engines, pitot tubes, static ports, antenna arrays, and pivot points. Don't spray de-icing fluid directly on windows. The hot fluid on the cold window causes small cracks or crazing. Spray above the window and let the fluid run down over the area. Don't forget the undercarriage and the underside of the aircraft. Check your manuals for specific areas that should be treated or avoided. Ask operations or maintenance for their input. When in doubt, remember the clean aircraft concept. There are more variables to de-icing than there are aircraft flying. So how can you be sure your aircraft is being de-iced properly? When in doubt, ask. Ask your apron supervisor about de-icing. Check your manuals for recommended procedures. On the apron, check again. Has the weather changed? The holdover time of de-icing fluid varies widely, depending on factors as simple as wind speed. Your de-icer is knowledgeable about most of the aircraft he or she services, but make sure. 
When in doubt, check your manual for specific areas to avoid during de-icing and communicate that information to your ground handlers. Some manufacturers recommend specific control surface settings for de-icing. Check your flight manual for complete details. Remember, if you change any of your pre-takeoff settings for de-icing purposes, to put them back to pre-takeoff configuration. Ground and air traffic control are part of the team, too. They appreciate the problems associated with winter operations and will do everything they can to expedite your departure. For rotary wing pilots, you often don't have an extensive ground crew to act as your eyes and hands. More of the onus is on your shoulders. You know how important weight is to safe operations. Ice-covered rotor blades exact a high-performance penalty. They become dangerous to everyone when they shed ice, and even more dangerous when only one blade sheds ice. De-icing starts the night before. Use blade covers, tail rotor covers, and a head cover, if you even suspect the possibility of icing conditions. In winter conditions, always use covers if available. Don't forget engine bungs and pitot tube covers as applicable. In the morning, after you remove the covers, check the fuselage and canopy for contamination. And make sure any ice or snow from the covers has not fallen onto the fuselage. When taxiing, especially if you have a delay reaching your runway, keep an eye on the time and an eye on your aircraft. When in doubt, get help. Have someone take a look. Icing conditions often mean slushy or snowy taxiways. By keeping your taxi speed down, you reduce the possibility of splashing contamination on your aircraft. Don't follow too closely behind another aircraft. His exhaust or prop wash will blow contamination back on you. Keep a watch on other aircraft. They're in the same situation you are. You can see parts of their aircraft they can. If you see something, tell them. The decision-making process is a complicated one. You have to recognize the factors and stresses you'll encounter in the decision-making process. Weather. Below freezing with snow and blowing snow. Low ceiling with more snow on the route and at the next destination. Aircraft. Good anti-ice systems, but near max weight. No snags, but a sizable takeoff run. De-icing. Done at the apron. Holdover is probably good for another five or six minutes if they weren't too close to the flight ahead of them in line. Crew, experienced. Contamination. Some observe snow sticking to one wing, some blowing around loose. Weather? I've flown in worse. Aircraft? Lots of power, if we stick on the runway and carry a few more knots. But we are on the heavy side today with snow on the runway, and there's no great run out at the end. A schedule? Late by five minutes now. If we go back and de-ice, we'll be 10 to 15 minutes behind schedule, and the boss will really be upset. And it's going to cost the company some bucks to de-ice us again. Stress, schedule, budget. To heck with all that. Life's too short. <laughs> Contamination. I can see this stuff. You gotta wonder if there's more. Well, when in doubt, do it. Tell the tower we're turning back. We've been in this stuff for too long. Ask them if they can de-ice us again on the apron to save some time. Good to see you, Captain. Your wings were iced up again. We've cleaned both wings and we've inspected everything again. You're now clean. Yeah, everything's great. Thanks. Oh, and by the way, guys, it's uh, sunny and plus 12 in Vancouver. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Have a safe flight. <laughs> Thanks. Making the right decision is your responsibility. Your team in the cockpit, in the cabin, on the apron, and in the office will give you the best information they can. But the final decision is up to you. When in doubt, do it.